Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 49, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. And here we are, second show of December. We're getting close to the big day now. Oh, and we're also getting closer to Christmas quiz, Dan. Yeah, now, if you haven't heard about this, uh, coming up on the Retro Hour in a couple of weeks, we were thinking, weren't we, like, you know, back end of last month, what can we do to celebrate Christmas? We wanted to do something a little bit different, didn't we, for our Christmas special? Yeah, so we we decided to do a quiz, and we're basically, we're going to put it online as well, like video of us all, and chat, <laughs> and uh, it's going to be a whole hour of jokes, drinks, and fun. <laughs> Don't promise jokes. Oh, no. <laughs> Pressure's on now. <laughs> oh, God, Dan. Well, you're the quiz master, aren't you? I am. I've got my sparkly jacket ready and everything as well. So yeah. uh, this is coming up um, the week leading up to Christmas. So it'll be, you know, just before Christmas weekend. Well-timed. Um, actually, we've got Aaron. Uh, Aaron White, formerly of the RGDS podcast. He's going to be getting the train down from Doncaster to Nottingham. Yeah, and uh, we're going to take him to Hooters as well. <laughs> <laughs> which is, uh... It's Aaron's birthday the day after that we record that show. Yeah, we don't so. take everybody to Hooters. <laughs> well, most people. Um, but yeah, it's actually conveniently located next to the uh, the studio we record this in and the train station. So uh, I think, you know, a few birthday drinks will be compulsory. That's going to be a funny episode, though, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah, it's going to be good. And Joe will be here as well, so it'll be the whole lot. And I've got my Christmas jumper sorted. Oh, God, I'm going to have to borrow one. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's a Sonic the Hedgehog Christmas jumper. That's cool. I've seen a lot of gaming-related ones. There's these Back to the Future ones with the DeLorean and... <laughs> fire on them well i got this in game i was just in there the other day and like they had like i walked around the corner because i've seen it online a lot of people been sharing these like sonic you know uh, christmas t-shirts yeah and uh i just walked around the corner and saw it's it like 35 quid but i thought oh, I nice it. so uh yeah so you know there's plenty doom of doom one might be quite good so yeah i expect a uh, high quality christmas jumpers for the episode if we're gonna yeah, be filming well, it. i'm gonna have to go shopping <laughs> that's coming up in two weeks time we're feeling festive now aren't we yeah and uh, this week on the show we've got a brilliant guest as well now obviously you know on the retro hour if you're new to the show the way that works every week is Ravi and I go through the technology stories and the retro stories that have been making the headlines this week. And also, in the second half, we dedicate it to a really interesting guest. Now, this can be, you know, a veteran of the video games industry. You know, we've had our former CEOs and MDs of big companies like Sega and Commodore, guys that made the games as well. But also, we like to chat to other people that are just as passionate about video games as we are. Yeah, and we love to chat to YouTubers as well because that's all we do. Sit there, yeah. watch their channels. I watch um, more YouTube than TV. Yeah, totally. And uh, we've had LGR on, and yeah. this time we've got... Adam Korolik. Now, Adam, I've watched Adam. I think he's been a YouTuber since about 2009. And I found his videos. Well, he does it in, in a regular series called um, Keep on Dreaming about the Dreamcast. And I think it's fair to say that the Sega Dreamcast is like his favourite system. Yeah, this is probably going to be like a little Dreamcast special interview because we didn't really have much of the Dreamcast in the UK, and they were often found in car boot sales and stuff, but he was you know, totally in there, in the American Dreamcast scene. Well, I've always loved the Dreamcast, and again, you know, it was it was, it was a console that kind of died before its time, really, didn't it? And one that, you know, I don't think we've covered enough on this show. No, well, I, I think it wasn't given a fair chance as well, because the PlayStation just came in and... Yeah, <laughs> DVD support. Yeah, <laughs> destroy. <laughs> so Adam's a really interesting guy, and he also does these kind of retrospective, like, series about, you know, every generation of video game systems. So. Oh, yeah, and he's so detailed as well. Like, you know, these these videos are 20 30 minutes long yeah. and it'll <laughs> it'll really tell you why it's in that generation and everything about it is great so if you love consoles um definitely such an interesting guy adam korolik is going to be on the retro hour in around 20 minutes from now and also every week the retro hour is brought to you by our very generous donators now um we do appreciate any donations that we get and uh, we've got a little tip jar on the front page of our website theretrohour.com little paypal link there It'll take you five seconds to make a donation. And, of course, anything you do donate helps us keep the show going throughout 2017 and beyond, hopefully. So a big yeah. thank you to this week's donators, Lasse Henriksen and Matthew Hudson. Really appreciate your support, guys. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. It's really, really helps. Absolutely. Right, let's get into this week's news stories. Now, what a bit of Sega news to start with this week. Yeah, so we've mentioned the game before, Tanglewood, which was um, a new game coming out for the Mega Drive that Dan managed to break when he <laughs> checked it at the National Video Game Arcade. Now, just, just in case Matt Phillips is listening to this, the guy that made it, hopefully he got it working again. You know, there's no uh, lawyers listening. Yeah, it. <laughs> but it, it was really I, I did cool. fix it. I blew the cartridge and it worked. <laughs> yeah, blow the cartridge, that always fix it. But it was done all with original SDK and Sega kind of development stuff, and it was on an actual physical card. Beautiful to see. But they're now saying that there's another game as well that's coming out which is absolutely crazy. It's not by the same guy. It's by a group called 
Mega Cat Studios. Okay. And it's called Coffee Crisis. I think I'm having one of them right now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, this looks awesome. This is a beat-em-up game. Yeah, so the kind of idea is that the Smurglian race has popped over um, f- to our neck of the galaxy and they're mainly here to steal stuff. So they're nicking heavy metal music, coffee, w- Wi-Fi codes, and you've basically got to beat them up so they don't get the idea of stealing our stuff and they leave. And they're stealing cat videos as well, apparently. This is, oh, this is all my favourite things. Yeah, there you go. You, you're going to be... Um, Empty of cat videos, damn it. Cat videos and coffee, dude. That's, without that, I've got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> damn these aliens. So uh, this is actually a Kickstarter at the moment. They're asking for $10,000, and apparently it's going to be um, fully boxed as well. Um, box Mega Drive games, though. I love Mega Drive boxes as well. Those games just look so awesome. Oh, yeah, the kind of plasticky hard ones. Yeah, they're really good. Big, chunky boxes, aren't they? Yeah. Well, there's a shop um, here in Nottingham called Playtime. Uh, they do a lot of retro video games and stuff like that. In there the other day, I bought my PlayStation 4 VR in there, but they have got a section like full of Mega Drive games. And even though I've got an EverDrive, and I'm not really a collector of like actual games themselves, I, you know, I have the ROMs on there, that's fine by me. I actually took all my old Mega Drive games in there, and you know, a lot of my old ones are on the shelf in there now. But every time I walk past them, they kind of catch my eye, and I just pick them up nostalgically and think, ah, oh. yeah. you know, tempted to buy them all back. I, re- I remember you. <laughs> yeah, you were mine. I might buy it back for double what I sold it for. Yeah. But, uh, but I, yeah, I think it's awesome that they're bringing out you know new box mega drive games in uh in 20 well 2017 i guess by the time it comes yeah out, and so. you know we've seen a lot of kind of 32 bit stuff released like new dreamcast games and new other system games but this is like pretty cool that the 16 bit consoles are getting a bit of a look in making cartridges can't be cheap you know, no, no, it. I can imagine. these. He had the little bare boards when I saw it before, so he's like, these are flashable cartridges, I think. So, And I guess they'll probably just get crap games and, you know, nick the shells off them and <laughs> yeah, repurpose yeah, them. That's generally it. what happens, isn't it? So, yeah, it's awesome that we'll pop a link in our show notes at theretrohour.com if you want to uh, back that. Definitely looks a worthwhile campaign. Now, um, <laughs> look at this next story. Someone has been maintaining a server for playing the Pokemon trading card game over the internet using Telnet. Now, Telnet, I guess our listeners won't know much about Telnet. I'm sure our audience will. Come on, they're all all geeks like us. <laughs> okay, well, it's a, it was an old network protocol that you kind of used to get stuff online, but um, it's basically built into a lot of Windows systems still. Well, it's like ANSI and ASCII-based, isn't it? It's text. Yeah. And uh, What I love about this is they actually posted this in um, the Retro Gaming subreddit, earlier this week and there's a web page up with a link to it and it's just an IP address that you put into like you know putty or uh, you know your favorite telnet server of choice uh, telnet client of choice and you go down the page last time it was updated was in uh, the spring of 1999 oh but so it still works it still works but apparently uh, of course it's got quite a bit of attention on reddit the server fell over the other day so <laughs> <laughs> probably have more requests on it this week than it has since like 1999 yeah, it's like, like what's what, going on here what's going on i'm giving up <laughs> i think it's awesome that it's still up and running though and you know july yeah july 3rd 99 was the last time the web page was updated or anything and even looking at the website here they've actually got screenshots of it running on windows 95 all the instructions are on there still so oh, amazing have you ever um played that little star wars game you can play in tech yeah Telnet, yeah, like, yeah. tell that as well isn't it Tell that though, you know, even just using it, you feel like a hacker. Yeah, it's well, I've been using this pocket chip and it's got the console in it, and like a lot of the kind of Telnet stuff is still like on Linux console. You know, you can type that Star Wars thing in and still get it playing within the console. Oh, you do it via Telnet, do you? Yeah, that's yeah, pretty cool. It's pretty good. Telnet's good though, because I mean, it's uh, I got really randomly, I was given an old, um, you, you know, I've told you I've had this for years and I've not done anything with it really. An old uh, Sun workstation. Oh, yeah, yeah. I saw it. I just see this big Sun workstation sitting in your room. <laughs> well, I got it from the university. Yeah. And when I got it, though, one of the, because it actually holds, it's, it's kind of like a BIOS, you know, that it has. But it's on like a, a, a chip with some battery inside it. And when the battery died, it forgot all its settings and it couldn't boot properly. So I found a guy who lives in Newark who actually like kind of makes these, reprograms them. And like, you sold me one, it was like 30 quid. Um, and I thought, I want to get up and running again. But it kind of got to this stage, and it wasn't displaying anything, so I connected it via Telnet into a PC, and you can actually access it and like re- do all the settings via Telnet, then the machine booted. So oh, got, so you did it like remote VNC style, but on, really an, on my Amiga 4000 to it, it was actually, I did wow. it, yeah. Old v- school. V- via serial cable. <laughs> now we're getting very nerdy. Yeah. Um, but I've got Solaris Unix and all that on there now as well. And then never turned it on again. But, you know, it was up and running. Yeah, <laughs> I was just fun of getting it working. Good to hear that it's working. Yeah. So the only thing about this is, though, um, this, uh, you know, Pokemon 
tell that game. I'm hoping, so it does say at the bottom here, Pokemon Trading Card Game is a property of Wizards of the Coast and uh, Nintendo. So, you know, I'm hoping Nintendo don't take this down, but it's got a bit of attention. I guess if it's been up there for that long... Let, let's not do, get... do you think the attention will kill it? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, play it while you can. Yeah. <laughs> get your Telnet client fired up again. You can get it working in Windows 10 and that, can't you, Telnet still? Yeah, yeah, if you actually go on to... I, I got it going the other day. Okay. So if you go on to programs and features, you can have add and install features, which is uh, the Windows kind of thing. And you just tick down it. Oh, then... it's still in there, is it? Yeah, oh, yeah. Hidden away. That's pretty cool. So yeah, that might be, a, you know, if you want a bit of nostalgia. It looks really cool, those Lancy kind of, you know, BBS kind of style graphics. Yeah. yeah. Very, very cool. So I'll pop that. Um, I, it's just an IP address. It's not even a website. <laughs> so I'll put it in the retrohour.com. Well, do you remember the old kind of compilation games from Epics, like uh, Winter Games? Oh, I remember like California games. Yeah, and stuff California like that well. games, summer games. games yeah. yeah, I remember playing those in school, some holidays on my friend Gary's Commodore 64C. Oh, that BMX in one. I'd always jump over the logs and <laughs> just get completely wrecked. Yeah, I love that. But, you know, these kind of multi sports games are always a, a, a little nice thing. And uh, they've just released one now, which is coming out for the iPhone. Okay. And it is called Retro Winter Sports. 1986. <laughs> Got the year in there as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, this looks awesome, actually. But, you know, you're right. Those kind of compilations, you don't really get many of them anymore, do you? But no, it's like... it felt like value for money yeah. because you were getting, like, Hacky Sack, all these other games, you know, that were... Uh... <laughs> Hacky Sack. Yeah, that was California, <laughs> do you remember that? <laughs> but it was, um, yeah, but I, I do remember playing it on, like, the Commodore 64 and that as well. Um, you'd have to pick which event was coming up, then you'd have to wait for the tape to load the next stage as well. And then, you know, oh, no, I, I was I played it on the Mega Drive, so I don't yeah, know. A lot easier on that, I imagine. <laughs> yeah. I do on the Commodore Plus 4 as well called Winter Events by Udo Gertz, and that was a great game as well. But, um, no, track and Field as well. Was another... That was a joystick destroyer, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Waggling your stick. So uh, this looks awesome, though. It's a proper throwback to kind of uh, those mid to late 80s um, sporting compilations as well. I love the graphics as well, because I mean, it does look like an old kind of maybe late generation 8-bit, early 16-bit game. Yeah, these guys, um, they've got a bit of experience. They're called Bite and Magic, which is a very interesting uh, name, like Light and Magic. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And they've kind of done some uh, RPGs and stuff before, so they've got experience in this uh, retro blocky iPhone stuff. They look a cool bunch of guys here as well. There's a picture of them on uh, Games of <laughs> yeah, yeah, they look pretty cool. <laughs> Long hair and all that. So uh, this is awesome, man. I think, you know, especially we were talking about Christmas games on the show last week, weren't we? Yeah. And, uh, you know, just these kind of winter Olympics and sports kind of games, you know, they really do capture that kind of, uh, you know, winter feel in them, don't they? You know, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't think there's been many kind of like, even like we mentioned Virtua Tennis recent, like, you know, for yeah. the Dreamcast, there hasn't been that many sports-based massive killer ones. What was it? Rockstar Table Tennis. That was a massive one. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not a sporty person, as you can tell from my physique, uh, but I, <laughs> I do like playing the uh, electronic versions of them. Yeah, right. Well, yeah. Pete Sampras Tennis as well. I, used to, I, I was a very big tennis fan. <laughs> I don't yeah. know why. Yeah. <laughs> so you'll be getting this for your iPhone then? Yeah, I yeah. I don't know if there's tennis in it, but you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, do you remember an addition... Um, for the Game Boy Advance called the Game Eye. Do you remember reading about that? Was this the camera? Yeah, that never got released. What, was it for the Advance? I thought there was a camera. Or was that just for the Game Boy? Yeah, th there was one for the Game Boy. That has um, a little printer and stuff. Yeah, I've got yeah. that, actually. Oh, yeah, cool. Game Boy Color, I think I've got the printer for it is. This is a, quite an old article, but there's a video of it that's surfaced recently. Um, this was from E3 in 2002. And Nintendo were working on um, a prototype... Game Boy Advance camera called the Game Eye. Now, this was, you know, pretty much like the Game Boy camera before it. Um, it hooked up to a proprietary printer uh, that wasn't shown. Um, and it was really to take pictures of the players' faces and import it into a game. So, you know, like, like the one before it as well. What's cool about it is, though, that they showed it working with a GameCube game called a Stage Debut. And there was kind of a link cable between the Game Boy Advance to the GameCube. You could import kind of your own characters that you took with the camera into the into the uh, GameCube game. Oh, that's cool. So you'd you'd kind of have a texture on the face, and it would be Dan Wood or yeah. Ravi Abbott. Yeah, like, <laughs> that's crazy. But uh, unfortunately, it never came out. So, there's, but there is a video of it at E3 that has been posted on YouTube. So you can kind of watch the report of it where the prototype ended up. You know, it never came out. But around that era, though, I mean, you know, there, there was also the Dream Eye. You know, for the Dreamcast. Mm, yeah, um, that only came out in Japan as well. I think. I, I toy as well, wasn't it? PS2. The, yeah, yeah. I've got one of those, and it's like, what what games were? Was there was actually quite a few. Britney Spears dance game with the iToy. Do you, do you play that at home? 
No. <laughs> <laughs> There was like there was like an eye toy kind of compilation that Sony released as well, but yeah, I mean, really, until like the Kinect came along, they weren't really that usable. These kind of editions, no, no, were they? yeah, but... that that was it. They're a bit gimmicky, and they all had the, the word "eye" in them as well, like "eye <laughs> toy," "dream eye," yeah. "game eye." You know, the iMac came and stole all of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for Apple trademarked it. Yeah. But yeah, nice little look at Nintendo history. There, I'll pop uh, the video to that in our show notes as well. Last week we were talking about laser discs as well. Now uh, this is a nice little uh, new story. Yeah, um, I saw on Techmoan actually did a video about it, and it's really interesting. If you look on Amazon at the moment, Disney are releasing Laserdisc-sized covers for the DVD releases. Oh, wow, okay. So these are kind of 12-inch covers, and I guess it's because everyone's liking the aesthetic of vinyl and seeing these kind of things in the shop. So these are really nice items. They're doing like stuff like the new Star Wars, Guardians of the Galaxy, and you can... You know, open these 12 inch things, they'll have like three discs in there or the bonus discs, or you'll get the DVD and the Blu ray. That's pretty cool. Cause I did say last week when we're talking about laser discs, you know, kind of one of the big appeals of them for me was just seeing the artwork in this big, like blown up size because it's so small and cramped on a Blu ray case. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't know if they're going to keep going for these or they'll keep making them or they'll stop, you know. So I think they may. You know, become maybe rare items in yeah. the future. These will. Well, they're only selling for what nineteen ninety nine at the moment. So yeah. you know, the pretty good value in this stuff, like a, uh, you know, Aladdin, Beauty and the Beast. Yeah, and if this stuff kind of picks up, you know, it might it might become the standard. These giant, fat, <laughs> beautiful cases. Well, I was in a uh, you know H and V and Fop the other day, walking yeah. around, and like uh, half the shop was vinyl. Yeah, they, they honestly they need new ways to kind of display items, and they need to make it more of a piece. Mm-hmm. Like you know, DVDs and Blu-rays, you get thousands of them, and they just look rubbish in shops. You go in, and there's that horrible plastic case, and yeah. or there's tons of sh- oddly shaped cases for like limited editions. But vinyls look beautiful. So you, you can see them when you walk in, I guess, can't you? Because they're big. Yeah, yeah they're, they're big. You can get all the lyrics inside. You can get extra. Stuff, you know, a lot of these have come with stuff like photos, you know, special scenes like the Star Wars one has certain scenes from there and little posters that you can get with it and stuff. So I think it's cool that's coming back, though, because, you know, I think you did lose something. Obviously, you look back around, you know, the mid-2000s and stuff when MP3 really took over, you know, even CDs. Yeah. And, you know, looking at your artwork on a little screen is not the same as having a nice 12-inch record with a beautiful you know, artwork on the sleeve and even yeah. the label inside. And I've got, like, bright blue and bright pink vinyl records and yeah, stuff. Yeah. And it's part of the experience, isn't it? So, And it's kind of just having it that size. It's like the size of a monitor or yeah. something like that. So it's really beautiful to see. If you're, like, a collector as well, just having that stuff on the shelf is just awesome, isn't it? So. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a particular Disney fan, but I think... You've got Beauty and the Beast, don't you? <laughs> Uh, I actually love the Robin Hood one. That's the only one I love. Yeah, oh, that's amazing. <laughs> if they did that, I'd definitely get it. Yeah. <laughs> now, before we get to this week's interview with Adam Korolik, um the Neo Geo is a pretty interesting platform. I will be honest, I haven't played a lot of Neo Geo games, but it seems they might be coming a little bit more accessible soon. Yeah, so um, SNK and Hamsters ACA, which is basically one of the big companies that made a lot of these games, SNK was, Mm -hmm. uh, they're releasing games and, they're well, they're re-releasing them for the Xbox One and Windows 10 PCs. So, you know, now they're doing a lot of releases where it's for Xbox and PC. Yeah, I think a lot of them, most of them are now, I think, aren't they? Yeah. Any Xbox game you get. Dual releases. So, uh, there's the big titles on here, you know, there's Metal Slug, Mm -hmm. there's the King of Fighters stuff, so Fatal Fury, it's, Really interesting. King of Fighters, That I was playing that game, actually. Um, I think we were at Replay a couple of years ago. Yeah. Yeah, fighting. It was awesome as well. It was proper, like, you know, it was as good as an arcade machine, which, you know, I haven't got a lot of experience with the Neo Geo, but that's always, you know, when I was a kid, it was always, you heard about that machine as being an arcade in your home. That's it, and definitely with Metal Slug and stuff, if these are, like, really nicely done conversions... Mm-hmm then I think these are going to sell pretty well. And know? apparently they're saying here as well, they've already started releasing some on the uh, on the PS4, but there's some different titles planned for that apparently. So, oh, okay. Yeah, so, if you like, I mean, you've got both systems. And... Yeah, maybe these more kind of arcade quality games will be coming for the Xbox One as they're trying to expand their uh, store. You know what? I think Xbox is doing really, they're doing the right thing at the moment as well. And it's kind of like, uh, 
you know, they're bringing so many cool things like this to it. You know, we talked about the, there was that GameCube collection that you could play in that a while back as well. And yeah, yeah, it's like they're filling out their libraries. <laughs> yeah, with, with old games by other systems. Yeah. But, you know, it's cool to see, you know, kind of obscure. I mean, I'd say obscure it obviously wasn't in parts of the world, but here in the UK, no one I knew had a Neo Geo. It's no, like, I, I don't think I ever saw one until I went to a retro show. Yeah, about two years, same here, about two yeah. years ago. I'm not a big emulation fan, you know, six. I think when you set an emulator up on Windows and you've got to download the ROMs and all that, because you haven't really played the original, you don't know if it's running well kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, if you haven't got the arcade unit next to you to convert yeah. it then. But I imagine with this, you're going to do a good job if they're selling it commercially, so. Yeah, and definitely if they're, titles as big as Metal Slug. Yeah. If they do a bad conversion of that, <laughs> that's not going to go yeah. down well. We're going to hear about it, aren't yeah. we? <laughs> so uh, we'll keep you up to date on that one. Very cool, though. Right, thank you for checking out episode number 49 of the Retro Hour podcast. Of course, coming up in a couple of weeks' time, it will be the big Christmas quiz special. And next episode is our 50th. Oh, my God. <laughs> my word. Midlife crisis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've actually got an amazing guest next week, but, you know, we'll tease you with that one on uh, maybe Facebook and Twitter during the week. Yeah, some very interesting tales there. Yeah. Very funny tales as well. Absolutely. So, uh, But speaking of amazing guests... Let's get into this week's special guest on the Retro Hour. One for the console fans, I think it's fair to say, this week. Definitely, and the Sega fanboys. Let's get him on then for the next 40 minutes or so on the Retro Hour, Adam Korolik. And we'll see you next week. Ciao. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it's time to welcome this week's special guest. You know, we always love it when we get someone on this show who we can get really geeky with about games consoles and classic gaming, and someone who just really loves gaming as much as we do. And this week, it's one of our favorite YouTubers. Welcome to the Retro Hour, Adam Korolik. Hey, how you doing? Thanks for having me. Very good, thank you. Now, um, just before we get into... Um, a bit of a chat about your gaming history and what machines you're into. I mean, for people that may not be familiar with your YouTube channel, mm -hmm. how do you summarize what you do on there? Uh, so I do, uh, my channel is just my name, Adam Korlick, and uh, I basically talk a lot about retro games as well as uh, gaming economics, gaming politics, and kind of the history of video games. Ironically, like the one thing I never do is actually like show and play video games on the channel. Uh, but like everything else, I got you covered. Oh, <laughs> I talk a lot about that kind of stuff. And uh, I do a lot of things where I like show uh, game stores from uh, around the world and stuff and do like tours so people can uh, have a sense of if they're in a certain place, like what kind of game stores they might be able to check out and what they can anticipate when they get there. And it's uh, all very console based, isn't it? Yes, very. I have nothing to do with PCs. So let's go all the way back to um, your gaming history then. What's your earliest memory of gaming? Uh, my first memory ever that has anything to do with video games, I think I was like two or three, and a bunch of my cousins all came over to my house, and they were just a few years older than me, but they they had just gotten the NES and uh, their Nintendo Entertainment System. You guys call it the NES, right? The NES. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so uh, they all came over, and they were playing it in the basement, and they were like super excited, and they were playing Paperboy, and I was just like blown away that you could manipulate things on a TV screen. I remember that. That's like one of those first moments where your mind booted up as a kid. You're like, oh, I'm a person now. And uh, it's one of my earliest memories ever. Paperboy's a difficult game though, isn't it? Yes. Oh, they wouldn't let me play. I was like two. But it was it was that I remember doing it. I think I played it a few years later and I, I was never any good at it. On my uh, brother's Atari, I used to give it a little go. There was a Paperboy on Atari 2600? I think it was Atari. Yeah, uh, I might, it, can't imagine that. It might have been an old old kind of wood grain clone machine or something. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly possible. So what was your first system of your own then? Uh, it was an Atari 2600. Um, basically, what happened with me is 1993, all my friends, my cousins either have a, you know, a Genesis or Mega Drive to you guys, and then an SNES or SNES. And uh, I, I'm like, you know, begging my mother. I'm like, everybody has something. I got to get something. And she was like, all right, I got you covered. And she like goes over and opens up this closet and brings out an Atari 2600. She's like, there you go. They're all the same thing. I actually had a lot of fun with that console. It, it held me over, you know, really until like December that year, Christmas, whatever. And then I finally got a Genesis. So that was about 10 years after everyone else had one. Oh, yeah. No, it was 10 years after the game crash. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, obviously, the Genesis, you know, what an amazing system. Um, what were some of your favorite games on that machine then? The standard answer, of course, uh, a lot of the Sonic stuff. I loved Sonic 2. That, to this day, is one of my favorite games. I was never a fan of Sonic 1. I know it's taboo, but I never I never liked that game. Um, or I didn't... I, 
didn't dislike it. I guess I should, I just didn't love it as much as the others. Like Sonic three and Sonic and Knuckles were fantastic. Aladdin was really, really good. Um, there was a game called McDonald's treasure land adventure, which is not a game you would think would be any good, but it was made by treasure and it was actually really, really good. It was like a really good platforming game. Loved it. Uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Hyperstone Heist. Although you guys called it Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles, right? Yeah, ninjas were banned here in the late eighties. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I thought. <laughs> um, yeah, because the first time I ever saw, I think I saw the arcade machine over there once, and it said Hero Turtles. I was like, what the? But uh, yeah, there was a lot of great Genesis stuff. Streets of Rage trilogy oh, was yeah. fantastic. Yeah, I had a lot of great experiences on the Genesis or Mega Drive. Well, we had Tom Kalinske on our show a couple of months ago, and he was telling us... Really? He, yeah, he's actually, he's actually still got a Mega Drive set up in his basement with Sonic 2, and he still plays it regularly. I don't, I don't blame him. It's a fantastic game. <laughs> Did you have any of the additions then, like 32X, uh, Mega CD, any of those? No. Um, I, I had never heard of the Sega CD when I was a kid, or Mega CD. Um, and then I had a friend who actually got the 32X when it was like, you know, that four months when it was relevant. And uh, I was just like, wow, this is, I mean, it was visually impressive, but I remember decisively not wanting it. I, at one point, I think I was given the option to get one or a PS1, a PlayStation, and I ended up choosing a PlayStation. But no, as a kid, I never had the add-ons. I got them much, much later, like well after it was discontinued, after the Dreamcast was discontinued. Did you have any uh, handhelds as well, like Game Gear? Um, I got a Game Gear, I got, when they re-released the Game Gear in like 2000, I got one of those. Uh, but the original run of Game Gear, no. I had a Game Boy, like the, the standard gray one, uh, when I was a kid. And then I lost it, and I got a the big, like, they did a, a series of colored ones, uh, where, like, transparent, like, the screen wasn't colored, just the plastic was different. I got, like, the transparent one. I still have that one. I remember the Game Gear. No one could afford to have one at my school. They, they ate through batteries in, like, ten minutes, didn't they? <laughs> oh, yeah, six <laughs> batteries, man. It was ridiculous. <laughs> So uh, did this kind of start a love of Sega for you then when you got the Genesis? Was it a kind of a company that you really had a lot of affection for? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it, the thing is, I, you know, I got the Super Nintendo only like half a year after I got the Genesis. And like I said, the Genesis wasn't even my first console. So like really it should have been Atari, but I don't know. I, the Genesis captivated me more, I think. I just ended up really finding a lot more replay value in it as a kid. Um, but yeah, like... It's hard, and then like I missed everything they did after that, like the Sega CD and 32X. Like I said, for the most part, I didn't really have anything to do with Saturn. I literally didn't know it existed until after the Dreamcast was done. Oh wow! Yeah, um, but the Dreamcast, I remember when they were marketing that. That was like, okay, Sega's back, you know. And I think that, you know, really fueled a lot of the Sega love. Was like quasi nostalgia for the Genesis, but at the same time, also giving you a really solid gaming experience that the Dreamcast did give you. Well, obviously, after like the 16-bit machines, it was kind of that weird era, you know, that 3D out, mm -hmm. USC, CDI, CD32. Were you aware of any of those systems at the time, or did you uh, get to see any back then? Yeah, the fourth generation and fifth generation is like, I, I comically refer to them as the graveyard generation, because there's just so many consoles that just showed up for like a couple months and then vanished. But with, uh, with regards to the, the Sega stuff specifically, uh, no, I, I didn't really know about many of those things at the time. Like a lot of them I learned about retroactively. Like I remember first time I heard about the Atari Jaguar or Jaguar. I know that's always a word <laughs> that I, <laughs> I'm always, people are always uh, chastising me for in the UK. Um, the first time I heard about that was I was in line to pick up a Dreamcast and the store I was in had a bunch of Jag Jaguars and clearance. And uh, that's the first time I'd ever heard of it. And like I said, I knew what Atari was, so it was odd that I'd never heard of that. 3DO, never heard of it. Neo Geo AES I had heard of mm. because that was like the console of suburban legend. That's that what the, the rich kids knew. had them, didn't they? Yeah, everybody knew a guy who knew a guy <laughs> who knew a guy who had one, maybe. Um, but nobody had one. And then the TurboGrafx-16, I think I, it was kind of a similar thing. It was like, oh, yeah, my friend Bob who lives in a different town, like his brother has one, you know. Uh, but nobody really, really had one of those. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think some of the other ones off the top of my head. Like nobody I knew had an Apple Pippin. I sure hadn't heard of that. Yeah, a lot of those consoles. Uh, I di I didn't have any of them as kids. I have most of them now, but uh, no, I didn't. Ha I barely knew about any of them when I was uh, in you know a kid at that time. So I find it really interesting that you said you hadn't heard about the Saturn because uh, I know we'd heard Believe about me, I know. it in <laughs> Europe, and I guess you'd probably had a lot of. Um, 32x kind of mm -hmm. promo and stuff over there so maybe you thought that was the uh, way to go and what's this obscure Japanese Saturn thing 
Yeah, the North American take on the, uh, uh, Sega during the 32-bit era was a bit different um, because, like you said, 32X was mostly an American uh, thing, whereas Saturn was really the love child of Japan. And so they pushed it in Europe and they pushed it in Japan. In here, they pushed the 32X more until they were forced to stop by Sega of Japan. And so, like, their entire attitude towards the Saturn in North America was reluctance. They, like, they didn't really want that to be their console. Uh, so it here was really only around for, like, a year and a half. Um, it's, they basically released it in 95, and then by 97, uh, they were already talking about moving on. And in 98, they didn't have a console here at all until 99, like late 99 when they launched the Dreamcast. So there was this, you know, year and a half period where they basically had nothing. And that was about the exact same amount of time that the Saturn was around here at all. Um, I think in the end, only like, what, 2 million Saturns were sold in North America? It, wow. it, it did not perform well here. I know in the mid-90s, though, it, it was a painful era to be like a, a Sega gamer, though. Cause it, I mean, you know, obviously you've done videos on this, but like retrospectively, where do you think Sega went wrong then? What was their biggest wrong decision they made in the mid-90s? Hmm. That, de that depends on who... You, I, would, I would pin it all really on poor internal communication. Uh, I still think that had Sega pushed the 32X in North America and never released the Saturn here, they probably would have done a lot better. But I get the logic of them not wanting to have two different... 32-bit consoles going on in the world at the same time. Um, I, I think that might be, not to use too much of a pun here, but that might be the genesis of their problems. Basically, I think releasing uh, both the Saturn and the 32X here when they really should have just picked one or the other. Um, because the, the logic, I guess, at the time in Japan was the Mega Drive wasn't doing very well. Uh, so they were like, we don't want a sequelization of it. We want it to be its own thing. And they were right to do that because the Saturn crushed it in Japan. In North America, uh, the Genesis was super popular, so Sega thought, okay, logically, we bring out this add-on, we let people upgrade, you know, for cheap, and then eventually we make it its own console, you know, the Neptune. That made sense, um, but the the Saturn didn't really make as nearly as much sense over here because it didn't give you that pre-installed fan base, which did exist and felt burned by Sega not involving them, and then it didn't support Sega CD stuff, so it was just, I think that really is what caused the problem. Um, Although you guys were much more friendly. You guys over there, you were like, yeah, whatever, we'll take it. But the Master System was big here. Yeah, that we didn't have that advantage either. Master System did not do well here at all. Um, and kudos to countries like Brazil for keeping that one alive, huh? It's still going there, isn't it? Like, yeah, somewhere. it's still officially going there. It has not stopped. The Master System is the world's longest running <laughs> video game console. It's, it's crazy as well because um, I remember at the time in England, we used to have lots of kind of new arcade machines coming out from Sega. So you'd have, like, Crazy Taxi, and you'd have all the other ones. So you kind of thought that Sega were doing really well, and then there'd be console flops <laughs> kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Did you have lots of arcades and Sega stuff? Uh, arcades kind of died a horrible death here in, like, the mid to late 80s. Uh, so they don't, they're not nearly as prevalent here. Uh, but I do remember seeing a lot of the Sega arcade stuff popping up in the few places that would have arcade sections. Like, you have to understand here, there aren't too many dedicated arcades. You know, you'll have, like, a bowling alley, and then they'll have, like, a miniature arcade inside of it. Um, and you would notice, like, 9 out of 10 machines would always be by Sega, uh, whether it was stuff like the, the Lost World Jurassic Park game, which was awesome, or any of that Dreamcast stuff like Crazy Taxi or 18-wheeler uh, Pro Trucker, uh, stuff like that. They, they would have those. Um, I never really noticed too much in the way of competition for them. They seem to be crushing it in arcades. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess we had a similar experience. Well, over here, they had um, Sega World in the middle of London, like, you know, a huge yeah. dedicated place. Uh, you <laughs> went there we certainly did yeah, that. It's, it's like four floors, and they had a go-karts in there and uh, silent scope. There was a brief thing, kind of like that. Uh, Disney did a thing called Disney Quest. It was like an indoor arcade version of their amusement parks. Mm. And they pretty much let Sega make all the games for it. So that was awesome. That only existed for like two years. I remember it was like 98 uh, or something like that. And you remember Alien Front Online for the Dreamcast? Yeah. They, they basically let you play that in like a VR type of setting. Like you put on this big old VR helmet 
and you'd be standing in this like rig with like a bar around you. That way you didn't like run away because you were essentially had this mask on. You kind of felt like you were playing Alien Front online like inside the game. It was amazing for like 98. Um, so there was that was the closest thing we had to it. But it was technically Disney's project, not Sega's. So do you remember when you first heard about the Dreamcast then? Uh, yeah, it was in 1998, like late 98 after it came out in Japan. That's when they started putting it in all, into all the video game magazines. I don't know which ones you guys had, but over here we had things like um, EGM and Game Informer and stuff like that. Because they all had their hands on it because it, it had already come out in Japan. So they were basically using most of that year to hype up the console. And I remember seeing depictions for all these games, and I was like, oh, my God, Sega's back. Sega's back because they were my favorite as a kid, you know. Um, and so – but to see Sonic go from 2D to 3D so intensely because, again, I missed the entire Saturn. So uh, for, to see him change like that was amazing, and I just – that's – it really amped me up, and I was super excited about it. Well, apart from that, like Sonic R, there wasn't really a proper Sonic game on the Saturn, was it? No. No, because Sonic Extreme never came to be. I remember they were promoting it with Choo Choo Rocket here. Oh, <laughs> Choo Choo Rocket was an yeah, awesome game. Early games like that. <laughs> so did you, were you there on their 9999 then in Q? Oh, yeah. That's the same. That was what I was telling you before. That was the same day I found out that Jaguar exists <laughs> because I was in line picking up my Dreamcast and then they had them up there. But yeah, no, I, I pre-ordered and everything and I went and picked it up. It was It was an awesome day. <laughs> You weren't tempted to get the Jag instead? No, no. I probably <laughs> could have got both. They were only like 30 bucks, 40 bucks, something like that. But I was like, no, no, no. Who cares? I got this. That must have been in that store for a long time then. Oh, yeah. It, it turns out that this, that store is a store called KB Toys. They don't exist anymore. But I guess at one point they bought up all of Atari's leftover stock. Because I'm not the only person who's reported on this. Like, KB Toys in the late 90s, for some reason, all had Jaguars in stock. Well, uh, just going back to the Dreamcast briefly, because, I mean, that's what kind of, you know, that's what got me into your YouTube channel. You do um, the Keep Dreaming series, which, are they your most popular videos? Uh, they used to be. Uh, now the ones where I just talk about a specific game console, uh, what I call video game recaps, mm. where I just talk about one console, its history, my experience with it, and some of the games, stuff like that. Those have overtaken it. But yeah, until then, yes, Keep Dreaming was the most popular thing I did. When you got it home that day then, what, what, do you remember when you first set it up and what game you first played? Yes. So I was in the car. Uh, my mother was taking me from the mall back to the house. And I was strictly under orders to not open it because it's going to be, you know, your birthday present in a few months. So you just kind of have to just, you were able to go pick it up, but you can't touch it. And in the car, I'm just like, okay, we have to change the terms of this agreement to some outcome where I get to play this tonight and I don't have to give it to you. And by the, by the time we got home, which was only a few minutes later, she's like, yeah, fine, whatever, go ahead. And so I set it up, and uh, I played Sonic Adventure. That was the first thing I ever played on that console. And uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun with that. I also spent a lot of time with that Dreamcast generator demo. I don't know if you guys got the same one, but it had a bunch of demos for like Power Stone, Sonic Adventure, and a bunch of videos and stuff. Okay. So yeah, that was a good night. <laughs> um, did you have any of the uh, strange Dreamcast accessories at all? Originally? No. Now I have like all of them, but uh, not when it was relevant. No. So you got all the fishing rods and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have that. I have, I have both the Interact one and the Sega one. If there's another one, that would be news to me. That Maracas came out for it. It's, I mean, in terms of add-ons, it's probably got more obscure add-ons than any other system I could name. Oh, it's got an insane number of peripherals, um, especially the Japanese ones, because they would they would make big sticks and controllers for like one game. Uh, like Virtual On had its own twin sticks thing. I did a video on. Um, there was a train simulator called Densha to Go Two, and they made its own controller for it, where it's just a train controller. Um, Pop and Music they had its own special like multicolored button uh, thing. Yeah, there was there was a bunch of really weird controllers. Uh, and you know, there's actually an independent game called Dream Para Para, only released in Hong Kong, and even it had its own weird controller. It's like got this multiple little pods, and you put your hand over it, and like it senses that your hands are there, and that's how it interacts with the game. So yeah, I don't know how that much hardware came out for that console, but it was really cool. I remember I bought a microphone just to play um, Seaman because I heard it was like you know so such yeah. a strange experience that game, isn't it? It is. I didn't play that one nearly enough because th that game is really really weird. Uh, just to to have Leonard Nimoy voicing the whole thing, and then you raise this like fish mutant thing, and it can talk to you, and you can talk back, and 
I don't know. It, it's a weird game. It's one of those concepts that don't, I think only works in Japan because the fact that they brought it over was kind of amazing. It's all in real time as well, isn't it? You've got to leave your machine on for like 12 hours. Before yeah. You, you know there's a second one? Only on the PS2, though. Oh, really? But okay. there is a Seaman, too. It's, it's un, unless you speak Japanese, it's unplayable. <laughs> well, the uh, first time I saw a Dreamcast was uh, around my friend's house. And I don't know if it was a few months after release, but um, he just put a disc in called the Utopia disc. And straight mm. away, he could start pirating games and playing backups. Um, what did you think about the whole kind of copy protection with the Dreamcast and the GD-ROMs? So, uh, you mean like initially when I first heard about it? Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. Do, I, do you know some history about the uh, cracking on there or the kind of... Yeah, way that... all right. Let me tell you what happened with me and then I can tell you the history of it if you want. Um, so, what happened with me was the first time I'd heard about it, the Dreamcast was already discontinued. And uh, everybody's like, yeah, you know, one of the things about this console is you can pirate all these games. I couldn't, you know, I was like looking it up. I couldn't figure out how to do it. And then eventually, um, I think I was going back to like dcemulation.com back in the day. And they used to say like, hey, if you just burn this, you'll have all these games like for the, you know, NES or SNES, Genesis, whatever. And that's that's how I started learning about how you do that. And, you know, hindsight, we know now you're really not supposed to do that because it's not really good for the console. Because um, a lot of those burns weren't really written with the Dreamcast's uh, best interests in mind. So they cause a lot of damage to it. Um, now we know why that is. So, so basically the Dreamcast is capable of reading three different types of uh, CD formats. One is music CDs, which we all know. Uh, the second is called GD-ROMs. That's what the games were. The third is a little known format called mill CD. It was just um, it was basically an extra line of data you would put inside of music CDs so that certain music CDs basically only in Japan would have extra code in them so that like karaoke discs, you know, you put it in, you listen to the music and then the Dreamcast would do extra visualizations that would only happen if you were playing that disc on a Dreamcast. Yeah. Um, so eventually, as it turns out, the GD-ROM is actually really, really difficult to crack. Um, to this day, you can't stick a Dreamcast original disc in a computer and rip it. You just can't do that. Um, no one ever really figured out how to do that. But what they figured out was that you could use the Dreamcast itself to rip the disc through the either the modem or, better yet, the broadband adapter. Uh, and then it would basically copy that data over to the computer. But then you're like, okay, well, I can't do anything with this data because the data is, uh, first of all, it's too big to put on a, a st standard CDR. And secondly, it's if even if I somehow magically got it to fit on one, uh, it's the Dreamcast won't acknowledge it as a GD-ROM. It'll think it's a CD-ROM and it won't play it. So somebody else figured out, wait a minute, you could that that third thing, mill CD, that's capable of reading data. So if you take all that ripped GD-ROM data and basically, you know, uh, reformat it to uh, a mill CD and then shrink it down, it it will fit and the Dreamcast will be able to read it. Um, now that's how all these independent games are made. Basically the independent games that are coming out, they have lines of data for the game and then they, uh, just have a bunch of, you know, music in it. So as far as the Dreamcast is concerned, that thing is basically like a karaoke disc. It doesn't really know the difference. Um, and, but they make that with, uh, with it in mind. Whereas a lot of the original Dreamcast games, they weren't supposed to be compressed like that. So as a result, if you put one of those in and you play it, you'll notice your Dreamcast kind of sounds really loud and it really doesn't want to be doing that. Uh, the laser is moving all over the yeah, place, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It, it's really not supposed to be reading games that way. However, it has been a really long time and people have played with that enough that they're starting to figure out how to make those original games compress successfully uh, without causing nearly as much damage as they otherwise would. So that's an important distinction. If games were made with the mill CD thing in mind, they tend to work well. If they weren't made with that in mind, they tend to not do so well. Do you um, think that affected the sales of Dreamcast games? I'm sure it didn't help matters, but I don't think it's really to blame. I mean, they figured that out so late in the game. Really what I think hurt Dreamcast the most was just the say, people just not really trusting Sega in general. And you can't really blame them. I mean, by that point, you'd had the Saturn, the 32X, and Sega CD had all bombed consecutively and people just didn't really want to invest in them and that's the same reason i'm worried about things like the nintendo switch because mm -hmm. you essentially have kind of a similar story there but that's a different matter I, yeah I, I don't think piracy is to blame i think it was just one of the factors because there's plenty of other consoles that could be easily pirated and it didn't really kill them 
Uh, if anything, it might have boosted actual console sales because people were like, oh, well, okay, I can go buy the hardware uh, and then not pay for any of the games. Really interesting to get the background on that, though, because, you know, I often read that, you know, people say the Dreamcast had, like, really bad copy protection, but it didn't. obviously, like you explained, it's very... I mean, the Saturn only got cracked, like, about two months ago, didn't it? I don't know if you heard about that. Yeah, I did. Uh, so, d- have you talked about that on the podcast? Uh, briefly, we've covered it, but n- not really in depth. Yeah, well, the... So, okay, I'll give the, the super short version, I guess. The, the Saturn has been cracked for a long time where people could play burn games on it, but you had to either know how to swap your disc correctly, or you had to have a mod chip that just kind of tricks the console into skipping the CD protection. But like that was the extent of it. Um, this guy figured out exactly where the copy protection is and in theory can shut it off entirely. And by doing so, would allow people to uh, make homebrew software and independent software for that console. Um, the fact that it took that long is astonishing. It's just it's very different from the mod chip because the mod chip bypasses it. This like disables it, uh, which is pretty different. It's a guy called uh, Doctor Abrasive. Have you watched that video? He goes so in depth. The like the twenty minute one. Yeah. yeah oh yeah. Pretty, yeah I mean, he, obviously, he's doing a better job explaining it than I am. But <laughs> yeah. So after a while, it became quite apparent that, you know, Sega weren't going to continue support of the Dreamcast. And when they did eventually, you know, kind of pull the plug on the system, where did you go next? And was it PlayStation 2? Do you go for the Xbox? Um, so I ended up getting all three, the GameCube, the Xbox and the PS2, because that's just what I do. Um, but I think in that generation, without the Dreamcast, I mostly focused on the, the Xbox um because it was kind of like the spiritual successor in a lot of ways Mm -hmm. uh and also i mean it was kind of i mean almost literal a lot of ways i mean like they a lot of sega's uh dreamcast stuff was either ported to the xbox or projects that were in production for the dreamcast were moved to the xbox um largely because the xbox was so developer friendly and these games had already been largely started on the dreamcast so it was easiest to move them over to the xbox but uh yeah that's kind of why i did that um I also like the console in general. And years later, I developed a lot more respect for the other two as well. Well, I think, you know, even looking at the original Xbox, I mean, the Dreamcast ran on uh, Windows CE, didn't it? So Microsoft had some involvement there. It was compatible with Windows CE. It didn't run on it. Okay. Yeah, I've made that mistake too. <laughs> it's, uh, it basically means, because it says it right on the console, and basically what it means is that if people develop a game on Windows CE, they can just kind of really easily port it over to uh, the Dreamcast, but there weren't too many games that did that. Uh, some that did, like Resident Evil 2 did that, and you can tell when you boot it up because it will actually tell you at that Sega screen that this was using Windows CE. Well, um, what do you think of the kind of modern Dreamcast scene? Because uh, a hell of a lot of games are being produced still for the system. I'm obviously a fan. Every time one of those comes out, I do a video on it. Uh, the Dreamcast independent scene has been active since 2003. That's when the first, like, hey, we made a game, we put it in a press disc, and we packaged it up, and we're selling it. That's the first time that happened. It was a game called Feet of Fury. And we've had at least one every single year, except for, I think, 2011. I think there wasn't one that year. But every other year, there's been at least one game. And over the last year or so, it's been amping up. Um, my basic theory on why it's amping up is that when there's tons of indie games out there, and a lot of them collect digital dust in places like you know Steam and Xbox Live Arcade and all that stuff. Um, but if you put out a game on the Dreamcast, you make a Dreamcast version, you'll get some press. Usually because people are like, I can't believe it, they're making a new game. How insane. <laughs> not so much to sell the Dreamcast version, but people also, wow, that's interesting. I mean, I'm not going to buy it on the Dreamcast. I'll pick it up on Steam. It just looks like a cool game. Basically, my point is I think a lot of... The Dreamcast games we get now are used as a way to advertise the other versions of the games. We just kind of get the nice fallout of that. Yeah, I was going to say, as Dreamcast fans, that's cool, though, isn't it? I mean, you get new oh, games yeah. to play, yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's it's It kind of, like, going back to that whole Coleco Chameleon thing a little bit, kind of what happened there is that they didn't have an install base. They had to deal with all the hardware and everything where dreamcast already has an installed fan base. It's easy to make games for, they're not responsible for the hardware. And I think that that's why it's kind of become the indie console. Cause it's also like the most advanced console that can read unsigned code, you know, where you don't have to get the parent company to like make the discs for you and get their permission and all that stuff. Cause Sega doesn't care. They don't go after anybody. And with that whole mill CD thing, anybody can make games for it if they want to. I think it's cool that Sega just let the community do what they want with it, though. It's, it's quite good that they don't get involved. And even back in 2004, you know. Oh, I agree completely. 
Because I imagine if it was Nintendo, they probably wouldn't be quite so forgiving. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, no. They would not be merciful. And there's uh, so many cool, like, homebrew developments, like the SD to ISO thing, where, mm -hmm. um, you know, people are putting on games that were never meant to be on there, weird compilations, typing of the dead, stuff like that, you know. Oh, yeah. You know, there's things like the uh, GD USB and the GDMU that allow you to take the drive out and put these boards in that read SD cards, and then you can boot games off of that. And then the load times are pretty much abolished. You know, it's kind of like it's almost like playing it off a hard drive. It's kind of insane. Well, I've watched your YouTube channel, and you've got loads of Dreamcast hardware. I mean, just, just yes. how much have you got? And what different variants of the Dreamcast do you have? I got the big Divers 2000 console, which is probably the most ridiculous thing I own. Um, I have the Dreamcast, starts with a T. Uh, it was a Chinese clone version uh, with like it's got its own screen and stuff. And then I have a bunch of the regular white ones. I have a couple of Japanese ones. Couple, I think I have one PAL console as well. Uh, and then like the Sega Sports one. I don't have too many like the weird repaints and stuff. Like I Japan got a ton of those. I didn't. I didn't really bother to get with any of those, just because they're really expensive. Um, and if I'm going to spend that kind of money, I want it to be at least interesting. Like the Divers is a, like a television with a Dreamcast built into it. That's insane. Um, but yeah, that, 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 I guess that would kind of be it. Oh, I also have all the development kit stuff or a lot of the development kit stuff. Where do you get all those from then? Uh, there was actually a guy in the UK who had it and, uh, he kind of decided he didn't really want it anymore for space reasons. So he just sent it my way. Wow. That, especially stuff like the Divers edition. I imagine that was some, uh, some expensive that shipping I, for that. Yeah. <laughs> I got that on eBay. Um, right. I got that back in like 2008, like when the economy crashed. So it was actually pretty cheap because people were just desperate to get rid of stuff. So I got that, I want to say, for like 300 including shipping from Japan. Now that thing, like you get lucky you get a used one for 1500 Those things are insane. And mine, mine was sealed. I opened it because I don't collect cardboard. But, um, you know, it, it's uh, really a nice, strange piece of equipment. Well, uh, one thing that really interested me was Bleem as well, which was a commercial PlayStation emulator. It actually came out for the Dreamcast at the same yeah, time. Yeah, the Bleemcast. <laughs> Uh, so Bleem, as you mentioned, they were a company founded by a guy named Rand Linden. And as you said, the idea was they were going to make uh, a PlayStation emulators. They originally did that for PCs, um, which I believe it's the first time you could actually buy a retail emulator for, at the time, a relevant console. Um, and now when the Dreamcast was coming out or was out, they decided they wanted to port the same concept to the Dreamcast and they called it Bleemcast. Um, and the idea was that you were going to be able to buy this disc and it was going to play like, uh, packs, like there were going to be like a hundred games per disc and it would support like a hundred PS one games, uh, on the, the console. So you'd put in the game, take it out and then put in one of the supported PlayStation games and it would just play in your Dreamcast and then it would play with additional benefits, taking advantage of the extra hardware and all that and better video quality, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they realized that console gamers aren't as tolerant of bugs as PC gamers were at the time. So they decided to do individual releases. The only three that ever came out was Metal Gear Solid, Tekken 3, and Gran Turismo 2. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you would get the, the discs, uh, and then you'd have to buy the game later. Um, there's, it's absolutely a fascinating piece of technology and uh, history because, it's first of all, it's amazing it got released. Uh, it's amazing it was even possible to do technically. And it wasn't even successfully cracked by the homebrew scene until, I think, last year oh, wow. because of how, how good the protection is on it. And the guy who even made them, he's still active in the community, was trying to give people hints on like how to do it without straight up telling them. Because what happened with that, the only reason they stopped, uh, they got sued by Sony four different times. Um, now, contrary to popular belief, they didn't break the law. Everything they did was legal because they wrote everything from the ground up. They didn't in any way emulate or and they literally emulated Sony stuff, but they didn't use any of their original software. Uh, so Sony knew it was frivolous, but they also knew that this company was too small to withstand all the uh, financial uh, legal battles. So like they just basically had to spend all their money paying lawyers to keep them out of jail. Um, uh, in essence. So they eventually had to cut a deal with Sony and say, okay, we won't make these anymore. Just drop all your lawsuits. And that's pretty much how it went down. Uh, in, I don't know how it was handled in, uh, Europe or specifically the UK, but here when it came to the release of the discs, they went to all these retailers and none of the retailers would sell it 
uh, under threat from Sony. The only exception was uh, EB Games, which no longer exists here. They became part of GameStop, although they still exist in Canada. Um, and they said, you know, they basically told Sony, like, the hell with you. We're going to sell this because it's amazing. And Sony said, no, you're definitely not. And they said, okay, if we're not selling it, then we're also not selling PlayStation products, which made up like 30% of Sony's sales. So they caved. And this was the one and only retailer where you could buy all the Bleemcast discs. And I remember buying all three of them because I thought that was just amazing. Um, Sega never gave them permission either, but Sega's official position on it was, oh, that's cool. <laughs> Sega were very tolerant though, weren't they? Yeah, like if there was, there's actually a lot of old like press releases from Rand where he talks about this and he's like, he's like, we constantly get angry emails from Sony with threats and we get like, funny emails from Sega that just say like, hey, you shouldn't do that, but eh, whatever, do what you got to do. <laughs> cool, cool product there, guys. Sega couldn't make any money off of it because they couldn't agree to like a licensing thing because, uh, you know, the way it works is when you make a game for the cons- uh, for a console, you make the, the console manufacturer print the discs and they also get like a royalty for every copy sold. Mm-hmm. That didn't exist with Bleem because they were doing everything themselves. So Sega wouldn't make any money, but at the same time, they recognized hey, if we're essentially taking all the games from our number one competition, that's that's just going to help us. There's no negative to this. So that was their position, which, yeah, no, you, do, you do you. I think I do actually remember seeing one of them on sale in the UK just because I was like, what is this? You know, a PlayStation <laughs> title on the uh, Dreamcast. It's crazy. Yeah, well. yeah, it was such an awesome concept. It's too bad it, it, they never released more. I know that they finished WWF SmackDown and Final Fantasy VII, but neither were released. Now, if you look on the internet, you'll find there was this like b- uh, Bleemcast prototype that it's like this open disk that will try to read anything, even though it's very buggy and it doesn't work. It's, sometimes it's called Bleemcast Blue. If you remember at the beginning of this, I told you they tried to do these 100 game packs. It was basically one of the prototype disks of that got leaked. Um, and it the way the, the games, the ultimate final versions worked is they would detect for the one specific game and they wouldn't even try to find anything else. They would lock it. Whereas this disc was never finished, so they never wrote a lock on it. So it will try to read anything, but in most cases it will fail. With mixed success when you play them. Oh, yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. If you want to see what the, 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 the highest quality of that product is, just get the three officially released uh, versions. So did you um, like collect consoles all the way through then, or did you have a break from them and kind of rebuy your collection, or has it been a constant thing? Um, so let's see, uh, when I was a kid, I, I got a few different things over the years, as I mentioned before, but I wasn't like actively trying to go out and get stuff because I was a kid, you know, I was limited to what I could do. Um, and then around, I think like a year or two after the Dreamcast died, that's when I started being like, I kind of want to get all of Sega's consoles. That's where I started with that was like, I want to get all of Sega's stuff because I was like, you know, they're not going to be making new things. and I think it would just be cool. Um, so I started getting stuff like that. And then when I got like the basic ones out of the way, you know, I got a master system. I had a Genesis. I got a 32X Sega CD Saturn. Finally, I was like, maybe I should look at somebody else. And, you know, I started doing that with Nintendo, got basic ones out of the way. And then Atari, same thing. Uh, and then over time it started getting into like, yeah, why don't I get an Apple Pippin? That would be cool. I should get an Apple Pippin. <laughs> it gets and addictive, just, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, and then so you end up with just a lot of weird stuff in a lot of cases you can't really use, but it's fun, man. I know you mentioned then your Apple Pippin. I mean, what, what's the – obviously, that's one of them. But which other obscure systems have you got then? Oh, dude. Um, so I have your uh, your country's beloved Commodore uh, CD32. Oh, the Amiga. Yeah, that was huge here. Yeah, the Amiga CD32. We didn't get that. Um, Canada got that in really limited numbers. The United States did not. So it's nearly impossible to get here. Um, I have a Philips CDI stuff, which over here is much, much less common – I, I just got an Amstrad GX4000. That's oh, wow. one of your countries. <laughs> yeah, that's one of your country's consoles. Uh, we never had that. Not one we're proud of. <laughs> you should be. It's it's a fun little machine. Uh, it's cool. I did a video kind of defending it. I'm like, yeah, this thing's pretty cool. I mean, I only have, uh, was it, uh, Burning Rubber? It's like the only game. <laughs> but, I think there's only about seven games on it, I think. <laughs> there's, there was, apparently there was 24. Oh, wow. Okay. 24. Um, but finding them is impossible. Uh, and I've tried, man. I don't know what... A few times I've been over there, I'm like, all right, where, where's the uh, Amstrad GX4000 stuff? And they're like, oh, yeah, no, no, we don't have that. We also had like a Commodore 64 like games console system that came out here as well around the same time, I remember. And that was like, that used cartridges really? and have no, had no keyboard. Yeah, it was only released in the UK, I believe. Maybe Germany as uh-huh. well. That's really I have hard not to find. heard of that. Yeah, the Commodore 64 GS, it's called. And I remember my local um, a shop called Tandy. It's like, you know, it used to be Radio Shack, part of them. 
and they were oh, yeah, selling, them, Andy. selling them off in 1994 for 25 pounds each, and now on eBay they go for about 500 pounds each. Ooh. Yeah, that's something I've Ooh. always regretted not picking up. Now these horrible <laughs> yeah, pastel colours. There's a lot it? of those. <laughs> And over here, I mean, you mentioned like the CDI. That's quite an interesting platform because I don't know if it was the same over there, but here there was kind of like this um, this kind of era where every company thought that multimedia set-top boxes were going to be like the next big thing. And yeah. you know, like, the Commodore CD TV came out around the same time as well. And obviously they went nowhere. And the cost of about like £500 were at the time. Oh, yeah. It's 3DO, same deal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah in hindsight, studying it, it is kind of like, Wow. Okay, you guys all really misfired. And then, like, eventually, the earliest version of the Xbox One tried to do the same tactic. It's like it didn't work out in the early '90s. Why are you trying that now? And then everybody hated them for it. Remember? That's an interesting uh, comparison, actually. Yeah. Yeah, it was all TV sports. TV sports is like, no, dude, they're video game consoles. <laughs> well, that part. Another thing that Sega kind of pioneered in was the online gaming. Did you have mm -hmm. any experience of SegaNet or any of that stuff? Oh, I tried, man. Back in the day, I tried to get that to work, but I, I never could. Uh, and then it was down before I really had like a competent understanding of how you would even set it up. Um, you know, interestingly, the Sega Saturn network still works. Wow. Now, the reason for that is it's peer-to-peer, -peer, so there yeah. is no actual network. It's like as long as you have like two modems and you like care enough, you can make that work. I know the dream, I've got the broadband adapter, I know you have as well, haven't you? And you can actually, yes, I, I know there are like communities of people that will hook up, you know, you've got to go at the same time, otherwise there's no one mm -hmm. on the servers, but have you tried any yep. online gaming on it recently? No, uh, however, I, uh, I am proud to say that I know a guy who's like really responsible for keeping that going, um, and he's also one of the guys who I guess really helped get, um, what was it Planet Ring? That was a game only you guys got? Yeah. That's back online. It's the only game on the Dreamcast. Oh, actually, no. It's the only game that came out in the West on the Dreamcast, meaning US or uh, Europe, that uh, requires an internet connection to basically do anything. Okay. Uh, and so it, the fact that that game is functional now because of that, that's really cool. Like, I would never have expected that to be the case. How, how do um, people like get online with their Dreamcast? And do you need the broadband adapter or can you do it with the, the dial-up still? You all right, so I haven't had to try to do this with the dial-up because fortunately I have the broadband adapter, but it is possible. Um, I think it's dreamcast-talk.com. Those guys will have all the information on how to do that. You can use a 56K modem and you can rig it to your PC, I guess, for slightly improved uh, performance. Um, but yeah, no, I, I haven't tried to do that myself. So are there any systems that you still want to add to your collection then? Anything on the, the hit list? The two that come to mind are the Milton Bradley Vectrex and the SNK Neo Geo CD. Oh, nice. Yeah, we, we all see the Vectrex at shows, and like, uh, I think engineers panic a bit when you bring one in. It always drains the power grid. <laughs> <laughs> That's so heavy. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've used it before. It's a cool system. It's really kind of a one-of-a-kind thing. Yeah, that also, display is just so sharp. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. That whole console was made because they had a surplus of monitors and they didn't know what to do with them. That's how that console started. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, obviously, on YouTube, you do do these um, you know, retrospective videos of different generations that you spoke about. What's kind of the idea of those and for people that may not have seen them? Uh, so that, that the origin of that was right after the 8th gen consoles, the uh, Wii U, the Xbox One, and PS4 had come out, I decided to do videos on the 7th gen, like the, the generation as a whole. And then I talked about the Wii and the Xbox 360 and the PS3. I just did like four separate videos, right? And I just kind of thought, it'd be kind of nice. Let's reflect on what we all experienced over like the last decade. Um, and that was, it was supposed to be like a one shot thing. I never thought anything would come of it, but people really liked it. And they were like, can you do a six gen, six gen? And I was like, okay. And I did. And it just kept happening. Everybody was like, can you just keep going? Can you just keep going all the way back? So, uh, I, I do them like generally about every six months, uh, just cause you know, they take a lot of time to do and I just have to find the time to do it. Um, but I, I'm going to make an announcement here on your podcast, the second video game generation series. You know, it's like Atari 2600 and all that stuff. That will be coming out in December. Exclusive announcement. There you go. Yeah, breakout <laughs> announcement, yes. I really enjoyed those videos, though, because, you know, the often kind of YouTube, you know, most YouTube gamers and reviewers and that kind of thing, they do like nine-minute videos. But yours can be like, you know, 30, 40 minutes, but they're just great to have on while you're doing other things. And if I'm cleaning the, the house or whatever, I'll have one of your videos on. It's just great to leave on and listen to. I appreciate that. Yeah, so, I try to get more in-depth, uh, and but I also focus on a lot of minutia, stuff I think nobody else would ever really care about, mm -hmm. as you probably noticed throughout the course of this <laughs> podcast. Do you have a bit of an affinity for the more obscure and like, you know, 
weird systems then. <laughs> yes, because there's only so many times you can talk about the history of the PlayStation or like the history of the N64. We know it. Let's talk about the you know the Magnavox Odyssey too. What was its story? <laughs> you know, I want to talk about that. I want to know how that thing came to be. You know, I, I find the history of stuff, the a lot of the economics, like how like a console performed or whatever. I find it fascinating. The consequences of it existing, all that stuff, I find really fascinating, and that's what I try to talk about in videos like that. Well, speaking of uh, systems that haven't done so well, um, I know at the moment you're aiming for a complete Wii U collection. Is that correct? I'm mostly done, actually, because uh, there's not it's not that big. And fortunately, a lot of that stuff hit clearance bins, and I timed it really well. So I have most of it, um, including like the stuff that was only released in Japan and then the stuff that was only released over there with you guys. You guys ended up, I think, currently you have like 11 uh, games that we never got okay. for the Wii U, something like that. And most recently, uh, Neo Fast Racing, you guys got? Yeah, we didn't get I, haven't, I haven't picked that up yet. It looks pretty cool, though. Yeah, uh, I would pick it up because you're the only place that got it. Well, there is kind of a lot of these kind of indie kind of games coming out on the Wii U now, isn't there? Uh, yes, yes, there are. And I, I have a theory on that, no proof. But I think what happened with that was that Nintendo realized they're not going to be making that many games for it. Mm. So they probably dropped uh, a lot of the developer's fees for the Wii U, and they probably dropped a lot of the minimum order numbers. Like, when you make a game... For like, let's say uh, Ubisoft comes along and they're like, "Hey, we want to put Assassin's Creed Three or whatever on the Wii U," which they did. They probably were told like, "Okay, you have to make a minimum of like a hundred thousand copies." That's fine for Ubisoft, but if you're like a little independent developer, you can't make a hundred thousand copies. That's really expensive. So they're like, "We can do ten thousand, something like that." Um, and a lot of the time, those companies, Sony, Nintendo, Microsoft, won't say yes to that. But in Nintendo's case, I'm guessing they just said, "Yeah, that's fine, whatever," because they want some games to exist while they amp up for Switch, because they know they're not making anything else. Yeah, they've got, like, Zelda, and that's, that's about it, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's my theory. I don't have any, like, concrete proof on it. It just makes sense, because they weren't allowing indie games for the longest time, and out of nowhere, you suddenly have a bunch of them, all physical editions. That I just, there has to be a logic to that. It's a bit sad, though, because I've had a Wii U, you know, since launch, really, and I, I love that system, but my brother, who's really into gaming, he, you know, I, I said to him, I've got a Wii U, and he goes, oh, I'm not into motion control. He thought it was just, like, a tablet for the original Wii. And he's a hardcore yeah. gamer, and he didn't know. I mean, yeah, uh, that's pretty bad in that case. But yeah, no, I get it though. Like, I have so I know so many people who thought exactly the same thing. I had relatives who said the exact same thing. They're like, you know, they were a couple of years ago. My cousin was like, "Hey, what should I get my kids? You know, you're into video games. You know, they're thinking about the new Xbox or the new PlayStation." I was like, "Why don't you get them a Wii U?" And they're like, "They have a Wii." I yeah. was like, "No." Like, I had to explain like what it was, and she was like, "No, that, that's not a thing." You know, it's like, "Yes, it is." And yeah, I had to like explain just like no it's not just an add-on it's not a tablet you know it's that was all nintendo's fault man they were terrible at explaining what that console was to people why do you think it failed then was that the major reason yeah that's i'm gonna, I'm gonna put it down for two reasons one nintendo was awful at explaining that they had a new console two they tried to appeal to a non-existent fan base the wii was a super explosive success because it appealed to everyone but traditional gamers it appealed to your soccer moms your grandmothers all the shall we say casuals they all saw it as like this fun party gimmick toy and i know because like my mother wanted one my my aunt wanted one people who never buy video games but whenever i talk to friends who actually are really into video games nobody was enjoying the wii other than like a handful of like you know super mario galaxy or whatever mm -hmm. but for the most part the wii was a huge disappointment to them myself included uh and the problem is that fan base that they appealed to didn't migrate to the Wii U because they, why would they? They're not gamers. They're not built into that like system. So what they did was they got Candy Crush and they moved on. Like they didn't, they didn't care. So you basically built this console that only appealed to nobody. Hmm. <laughs> and the irony is that it's actually really, really good. I love that console, the Wii U. But uh, I think that's really where they went wrong was they aimed it at the wrong market and they did a really bad job of explaining what it was to that market. I think you're right. My grandparents have got one, but they just think it's like a bowling machine. It's like <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, right? I've literally heard it called the like the bowling machine yeah. multiple times. That's what they think it is. Because, you know, it came with Wii Sports and the best part of Wii Sports was the friggin' bowling part. And that's what everyone thought. They're like, "Oh yeah." And then like some people uh, I've heard stories of people with like, you know, casuals who own these things. They'd bring it over to like parties or something and then they'd forget it and leave it because they just didn't care enough. Yeah, it's, it's like, like that, that's not how you treat a video game console. <laughs> that's how you treat some, you know, piece of junk you got at a party store. That's not that's not what you do with a game console. And I think I've said this before, man, but like I can only imagine 
the amount of those things that are going to pop up in Goodwills and charity shops like you guys have yeah. in the in the future, they're going to be so common. It's going to be ridiculous. I see them already in the like about 14 pounds. They're like, there you go. Like, and it's going to get away. cheaper because they're going to, there's a hundred million of those things out there. There are not a hundred million people that want them. So how confident are you feeling for the switch? Cautiously optimistic. <laughs> um, I, I don't, they haven't given me a reason really to think that they're going to knock it out of the park. I want one. I'm excited about it. I think it'll be a, a quality console, but I'm not confident that it can compete on a hardware level, which was one of the big mistakes the Wii and the Wii U made. Uh, and I, I admit their marketing this time is better. They're doing a better job with that, and that's that's essential. So if they can if they can crush the marketing and get people to buy this thing despite the um, flaws of the hardware, then great, you're you're still in there. But if they can't do that, then strike three, you're out. Well, I'm sure you'll have a video up when uh, you get your hands on one. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. I, I hope it's not the usual Nintendo logic. I, I don't know. I think they do this differently for you guys, but over here, they intentionally shortchange us on the amount of hardware they release. Yeah. Uh, they did that with Amiibos. They did it with like the NES Classic. Although, I mean, I've been to Europe during those times, like when Amiibos were insane here. You go to Europe, you guys have them everywhere. Nobody seems to want them. They s supply them much better there. Whereas here, they create this weird false demand so that they can keep getting us to buy what we can't have you know what i mean yeah we That's noticed how, um kind of we're kind of nuts over here we noticed a lot of the mini nazas and that they were saying they were short on stock and then suddenly all our places start getting supplied and in America, mm -hmm. they were still short on stock. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's how it happens. There's Nintendo does that all the time. It's very weird. But, hey, if, if they think they can make money doing that, then I guess more power to them. Well, Adam, it's been amazing talking to you. And uh, keep up the good work with your YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. No problem. If people want to find you online, um, have you got any uh, Twitter or uh, websites or obviously YouTube channel? Where can they find you? Yeah, it's literally my name in all of them. Uh, Adam Korlik, K-O-R-A-L-I-K. Uh, just all one word. You can look that up on Twitter. Uh, you can look that up on my Facebook fan page. All that stuff. YouTube, Instagram. It's all the same. Excellent. Thanks very much, Adam. Thank you. Thank you.